Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Campbell Rogers. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at HeartFlow, and it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to today's webinar, Expanding the CCTA Toolkit, the Impact of Anatomic Visualization Using the HeartFlow Roadmap Analysis. We're extremely grateful for people taking time from busy schedules uh, to join for what I believe will be an instructive and valuable conversation. It's my privilege to welcome as the faculty for this webinar, uh, two people. Uh, first, Dr. Manil Shah. Dr. Shah is the co-director of cardiovascular CT and MRI and associate professor of medicine at Allegheny General Hospital. He provides in his practice specialized care for individuals with cardiac symptoms. He's level three certified in echo, cardiac MR and cardiac CT. Dr. Shah earned his medical degree at Northeastern Ohio Medical University, did his residency at Ohio State in Columbus, and cardiology fellowship at, at Allegheny, and then an advanced imaging fellowship at Stony Brook in New York. Now, he has been instrumental in growing the CTA program at Allegheny, and in particular, working with Highmark on an FFRCT pilot study several years ago that led to Highmark, uh, the, uh, the health plan's adoption of FFRCT and its medical policy uh, which other payers then uh, quite quickly followed suit. So Dr. Shah, thank you for taking time to join us today. And second, Dr. Michael Morris. Dr. Morris is the Director of Advanced Cardiac Imaging at Banner University Medical Center in Phoenix. He received his medical degree from Dartmouth, completed his radiology residency at Columbia, and then fellowship at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, Dr. Morris currently serves on the SCCT Advocacy Committee and the RSNA Program Planning Committee for Cardiac Imaging. Uh, Dr. Morris is a strong believer in the primary role of CT for the evaluation of coronary disease and advocates for the pivotal role of FFRCT in further enhancing and advancing the value of CTA. So again, thank you all for joining. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, Dr. Morris, for spending the time educating us today. And I'm going to turn it directly over, Dr. Shaw, to you to kick it off. Okay, uh, thanks, Campbell. Thanks for the introduction, and uh, good afternoon and welcome, everyone. Hope we all have a, ni a nice discussion today. Uh, let me share my screen here. Okay. I think we should be good. Okay. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> first we'll kind of, you know, go kind of give an overview of, of Roadmap uh, and how we've incorporated here at Allegheny General uh, and the benefits that we've seen from it. Okay, so just to, just to give an overview um, of our hospital, our system, Alle Allegheny General, which is part of Allegheny Health Network, we're here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, what we've seen in the, you know, I've been here since 2011 and kind of, you know, seen the growth kind of, you know, happen in front of our eyes. In the last 10 years, I think like a lot of other places, the, the volume for uh, CCTA, specifically for coronary evaluation, we've had growth about uh, tenfold. Um, <clears throat> we're currently, we're doing about 15 to, to 20 studies, coronary studies a day. And that's spanning, we, we have a, a large, health, large health system here with nine different um, hospital, uh, inpatient and, and out, outpatient sites that are doing CCTA. Um, so it's become quite, you know, when I first started, we were doing two to four studies a week kind of a thing. So it's, 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 it's grown exponentially. We have a group of 11 readers. It's a nice collaboration of cardiologists and radiologists. There's five cardiologists and six radiologists. Um, and it's, uh, it's a nice, nice mix of people. You know, a few of us have you know, been reading for over 10 years. We have some who uh, it spans the continuum. We have some who've been reading three to five years and we have two who just started last fall. And so they're just in their in their first year reading, um, right right out of fellowship. Um, so it's a it's a kind of a heterogeneous group. And our reading structure, in general, we have one global reader who will read most of those fifteen to twenty studies. Um, however, we have started to have some local readers at some of our smaller sites who will read all the studies from that place, just because it, is, it has gotten so busy. And specifically, um, as cardiologists, often we are you know, CT won't be the only thing that we're covering for the day. We're double covering with echo or, you know, some of us who read MRI as well, we're covering MRI. So we're kind of managing multiple, you know, wearing multiple hats in one given day. And so it, it does become quite busy. 
Uh, the other point it, it, uh, is also with, with our program, we have an active cardiology fellowship and um, we've been pretty progressive in, in involving CT in the curriculum so that currently uh, there's a CT rotation in built in each uh, year of the three year fellowship. So that most uh, current, most these days, most fellows are getting a level two training and board certification. So there's a lot of interest uh, and, and, you know, in CTA and, uh, and developing training for, uh, for fellows. So that's, that's a background of us. So let's talk about roadmap. So the idea of roadmap analysis is that it's, the hope is that it's to, you know, enable readers to, you know, to provide accurate, efficient, and consistent stenosis identification of coronary vessels and to hopefully streamline things so that the reads can be done efficiently and identifying who are the patients who need FFRCT. Because of course we know not everybody needs it. So it's about facilitating that workflow. Um, so what you see on the screen is this is an example of the roadmap overview. And the first page gives you a spider shot of the coronary uh, uh, vessels, the coronary tree. And so this is in PDF form. And so every CCTA that uh, heart flow that that meets heart flow's image requirements for quality will have a, a PDF roadmap analysis. Um, and, and, and anatomy is provided for all vessels that are more than 1.8 millimeters. And the idea is to highlight stenoses that are at least 30% or, or more uh, in severity. Um, and so this is a tool to help enable physicians to look at this in conjunction with the study. Um, and then this, these, this PDF can be um, integrated into your PAC system. So how, do, how does this all work? What, and so again, the, the first thing obviously is, is acquiring the CTA, doing the CCTA, acquiring those images, and then sending it uh, to HeartFlow for that you know, <clears throat> personalized in, in a 3D modeling of the coronary anatomy that you know, most programs are familiar with who, who have been involved with heart flow. Um, again, taking the data, developing center line segmentation, um, and then the, and, and developing this uh, highly precise three dimensional model of the coronary tree. So from there, that's where things kind of split off because there's, this is where a lot of information gets derived from. And so, and so there's three pieces to this. So again, there's the, the anatomic analysis and that's what roadmap provides is an anatomic analysis. And of course there's the physiology with the FFRCT component and also plaque assessment as well. So uh, the same source of information, but three different pieces of, of uh, an analysis that come from it that are different, but are also complementary to each other. And so specifically talking about roadmap. And so again, this is an anatomic analysis. And so how we use it in our workflow, how I like to use it is, again, you start, of course, with the patient, they're gonna get the physician orders as CCTA. You, we take those images and it's sent to heart flow. And so then you get your PDF back. And so how I like to use it is, uh, I'll, you know, when I'm about to read a study, um, I'll, I'll pull up the roadmap first, just to, again, to, to give me this, the preview to, to know, okay, what am I dealing with here? Is, is this really an essentially normal study? And so, and, and, and we get normal coronaries, or are we, are we gonna see a high burden of disease? And now with, with this preview that I'm given, I can know, okay, now I know where, where I need to really focus my attention because of what it's delineating. So we get you know, normal coronaries, or are we talking about um, highly obstructive disease that we're gonna need FFR and potentially this patient need revascularization? Or is it gonna be somewhere in between where there, it's not normal coronaries, but it's not obstructive, and those patients are certainly uh, important to identify because you want to, uh, you know, initiate aggressive medical therapy. So looking at this roadmap analysis um, up front, um, I think it, again it helps, especially when you when you have you know 10, 15 studies in your queue, and okay, I, you know, and again we're double covering, and, and and then we're reading with fellows. So again, that, that that takes a little more time as well. What can we do to make things more efficient? And having this preview kind of helps set your mind to know, okay, what, where, do, where do I need to go? In terms of the analysis itself, this, the PDF, um, so the overview, the, you know, the, the, it's a multiple page document. The first page is the overview, the spider shot of the coronary arteries, where you can, you see all three vessels and, and then highlighted where there's potential areas of, uh, of plaque or stenosis. 
Um, and then, you know, page, so pages two to four will be the vessel specific pages highlighting each vessel specifically with, with the roadmap schematic paired with uh, curved NPRs that are, uh, that are part of the document itself. So it's kind of, so it's nice. So, so you get to see, uh, you know, so you're not, you're not just looking at just this, this, this schematic itself, but you're seeing the source data in a curved NPR format to know, okay, aha, I, now I see what, what they're highlighting because look, look at all this disease here. So you have this reach vessel and the last page is more of your disclaimer warning page. And then, and then this document when it's returned can be integrated into PACS. Again, it, it is available on, on their website on, you know, from the, the front page of uh, the HeartFlow website where the FFRCT can be available as well. But it's, it is, it's a nice feature that it can be integrated into PACS. So that way you don't have to seek it out. It'll be there. You're opening up PACS, look at the images and there is the analysis is there as well for you to, to review. And so again, uh, for each study, this this will be available for it um, as long as the quality is, is sufficient, and and it's and it's and becomes it's it's a one so your packs becomes the one stop shop to view all the information that you need. Um, and then just to, to to describe you know how they define the, you know the the color coding legend. Um, so again. Using ranges of uh, 30 to 49 percent, 50 to 69, 70 to 99 percent, and this color coded yellow, uh, red, and purple to denote these, as you see in, in this diagram here, um, and then and then denoting where the lesion is and if there's serial stenosis versus a focal stenosis, and then there'll be a little arrow which indicates where the most se severe min uh, minimal luminal diameter within the lesion is. Uh, and, and how it's depicted. So when you have your CCTA image in the plaque, it, it, again, it, it could, it's, you know, commonly we see eccentric plaques. Now that, will, that part will not be uh, conveyed on the roadmap analysis. Um, so again, the wall and the plaque are represented as a flattened image. So the, the image will show you the vessel wall, show you where the plaque is, and then highlight, you know, the severity, uh, again, which again, which again is AI generated to determine severity of stenosis. So in this example, Again, uh, vessel wall and plaque, uh, plaque here that is less than 30%, so not highlighted. And then as we go further, you see, um, you know, uh, <coughs> plaque here of varying degrees of severity of stenosis that are highlighted. And, uh, and the thresholds are, are nicely aligned with CADRADS 2.0. So, um, so it, it doesn't, you know, it, it's consistent consistent with what we, we all use in terms of CADRAS 2.0. Uh, and so that matches up nicely uh, with that. But uh, in all this, a key point to highlight is again, this is an anatomic analysis. This is not meant to replace FFRCT. Um, this is not meant to replace your interpretation of the images, but it's, it's, it's made to again, to, to give an initial analysis of, of where, of where uh, you know, this AI generated uh, where, the, where these stenoses are seen. Um, because it's important to note, again, as we all know, uh, a, a, anatomy does not dictate physiology. And, and we see that this is data from the advanced registry and how the severity of stenosis does not correlate well with uh, where the physiologic FFRCT is. And so you see even in 30 to 50% lesions versus 70 to 90, you know, it's, uh, it's it, <clears throat> lesions of varying stenosis can, can generate an FFRCT less than 0.8. So again, so it's important to keep that in mind that again, this, this, is, this is just, this is the initial anatomic evaluation that we're talking about here. Okay, and then um, just, just have one case I wanted to highlight, um, and then we will have several cases after that with, uh, with Dr. Morris. Um, but this, this was one that was done here a few months ago. This is a 37 year old female presenting with chest pain. Um, she had a history of preeclampsia with her second pregnancy uh, one year prior. She had a strong family history of early CAD with her father undergoing cabbage at age 32, so quite strong. Um, she also had a, a paternal uncle with sudden cardiac death and a maternal uncle with MI in 50s. So she presented to her cardiologist's office with exertional chest pain when she was rowing with a rowing machine and arm numbness in both arms with a spin bike. She was, she was quite active otherwise. So um, she underwent a coronary CTA. Um, here is the roadmap analysis for her. And as you see in this case, 
Um, again, the quality has to be good enough. So in this case, the RCA, there is motion artifact, which I'll show you in a moment. So the RCA is grayed out, just like how we sometimes we see that with our FFRCT analysis. Um, but what we see strikingly is on with the LED uh, in the left main is the potential areas of stenosis here in the left main, as well as um, uh, in, in the proximal and, and mid LED, up to, upward, up to 70 to 90% in these two areas. So when we see this at our initial, okay, this, this is striking. And, you know, and again, it's a way to potentially triage which studies are you going to read first? You know, you know, and so it is okay. Let me let me take care of this study first because I know it's going to spend a little more time. This other study with normal coronaries, I can get to afterwards because I know I'm not going to need to spend as much time on it um, after reviewing the, the analysis. So when we go to the vessel specific page where we have our um, our schematic along with the curved NPRs, um, again there was a question potentially 50% left main disease here. Now, uh, what we actually see in the left main, actually, again, there's a little bit of vessel tapering, which may be why the AI picked up on that, uh, but no specific plaque there. So that's reassuring, at least. And again, it's, it's a nice display that, to show that, again, what, what the roadmap does is it points out areas of potential concern, but you still want to look at the actual images. And, and again, no technology is perfect. But what, what it does show and is, again, in this proximal area, we see calcified plaque, which doesn't look... Uh, too concerning here. But then you get to some more complex calcified, partially calcified disease that, you know, the roadmap analysis is suggesting 70, 90, 99%. And that in looking at this initial view, you, you would think, okay, well, yeah, I think, I think they're onto something here. I think there's, there is, but this looks potentially significant. Um, and again, another non-calcified plaque here, 70, 99% and some moderate disease here. So, and you again, seeing different perspectives uh, of, the, of the LAD here. Again, you're seeing the small channel of contrast. So again, very concerning. And then here are the, the curved CPRs generated from our software. Well, we, we use Terra Recon here. And so again, just to show, here's your le left main LED. Again, le left main looks good. But again, to show that this LED, you know, what, what, what is presented to us in roadmap matches up pretty well with what, with what you generate on your own with, with, with whatever various software that you're using. Um, here's a circumflex confirming what we what the roadmap showed in terms of no disease here, and then I also just showed the RCA to show again there is some motion artifact here. You see some misalignment and some motion here, so no significant disease seen. Kind of you know you look at this area. What about this? Well, again, there's motion here, so you want to be careful. A little bit of a moot point because again she's she's already bought herself a cat based on the, the uh, LAD disease, and then the corresponding FFRCT again showing the significant drop. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the very low values um, in, in this LED distribution, 0.57, more distally, and again, uh, 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 in, the, in terms of the delta, the translational gradient too, which is significant. So again, this matches up nicely, correlating with uh, severe stenosis in the proximal LED. She did go on for left heart catheterization, and you see here this step down and that significant disease shown into the proximal and mid um, LED here and as, as well here is here in the LAD in this corresponding view and she uh, she underwent PCI with a nice result. So uh, to, so to summarize, so again a roadmap analysis giving you an accurate identification of coronary disease, the locations of plaques of stenosis, the areas where you, you are, want to then focus on. Um, it streamlines our interpretation process to facilitate reads and it helps us in managing, again, the exponential growth that we, we've seen in our program. Again, when we're reading 15 to 20 studies and we're double covering at times, it's nice to have a tool that can help facilitate that because, because we all know that it's only gonna get busier. And especially when we have readers of varying uh, you know, experiences, um, having a, a, a tool that can help establish consistency and especially for our more junior colleagues, something to, you know, to, 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 to help assist in them. And it's a great training tool for, you know, for radiology residents, cardiology fellows. Um, they, they seem to like it a lot because, again, they're, 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 these are people who are total novices at it. And to have something for them to kind of help train their eyes, um, they, they really like that as well. And uh, that's all that I have. Great. Dr. Shaw, thank you so much.
Uh, and before moving to Dr. Morris, there are a couple of questions that have come in. Maybe we can cover off on them quickly. Um, the first is, and I know, Dr. Shah, this is an area near and dear to your heart, relates to the emergency room use and timing of, of these different products, roadmap and FFRCT. The question is, if we're performing in the ER observation unit, it normally takes two hours for turnaround to FFRCT. Will roadmap add to that, uh, add time to this turnaround time? Uh, I would say from the heart flow perspective, the answer is no. When studies come in for FFRCT, they're processed for that instantly. And if they're coming in from an ER and that's flagged with a high priority designation, then they're they're at the top of the list. Uh, from your experience, so Dr. Shah, knowing how much you know, you're, you've spent time in the emergency room application of these technologies, how how do you see that? Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, we we've been using a, uh, we've had a large growth in the ER uh, in the last couple of years, and and like you're saying, I mean, the turnaround time when we can we we have you know when it's an inpatient case, the turnaround time is you know hour and a half, two hours, um, and so that that allows it. To, the short turnaround time has not prohibited us, and and the roadmap analysis is available for those. And so it's been, uh, it's, it's, it's worked well right. in that situation. And then the second question is left main red is 50 to 69 on roadmap, look clean on curved NPR. As I heard you talk about that in the discussion, Dr. Shaw, you mentioned some tapering in the vessel. And I would say again, from the heart flow side, you know, the, the analysis is done. The AI looks at that and says, perhaps there's some narrowing here. And as I heard you say, your workflow is one that just then draws your attention there. Mm -hmm. And you're able to either confirm or or refute, and then move on in a in a pretty rapid way. Yeah, exactly. I, I use it as okay. Well, let me let me let me let me let me look at those areas again. We're going to look at everything, right? But I certainly I will pay more attention to the areas where the, those are highlighted, and to see. But again, because you want to you want to look at you still need to look at the study itself, and and look at the raw data. Look at your own look at your own curves. Uh, uh, you know, NPRs, and so. And then, and then decide. Okay, is this something that's 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 real, or is this something that maybe they're, they're picking up some some other feature that's causing it to, to look like a stenosis? So, um, yeah, I, I think it's um, it, it it doesn't. Uh, you know, I, I think it's 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 there. It, it's a good way to to highlight those areas, but again, you still want to verify uh, on your own. Right. And then I, there's one more really quick question that came in. I will deal with, and then Dr. Morris, turn it over to you. The sister. Uh, factual question, Dr. Shaw, is this study done with the 64 slice CT? So can you remind folks what scanner you did that study on? Oh, the, 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 our example, that, that was done. We have a, a Siemens Force. So it's a, a dual source, uh, 192 slice scanner. So uh, uh, now we don't have that at all of our sites, but th that case, ex that example specifically was done with, with the Force. And, and, and I would just say from the heart flow perspective, a scanner is 64 slice or greater are what are required. Yeah, yeah, we have we have a few sites that with still a single source, sixty four slice, and, and um, it doesn't preclude us from getting roadmap or FFRCT. Right. All right. Well, Dr. Shaw, thank you so much, and Dr. Morris. Without further ado, let me turn it over to you. And again, thank you for making time from your what I know to be an extremely busy life uh, to share with us. And well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Appreciate the time that you're spending with us, um, recognize the importance of your time as well. Let me just start my presentation here. Um, so I'm, I'm going to share with you some cases um, of how a roadmap has been integrated into our practice. And really, the point of this part of the presentation is to build upon the fundamentals that were shared with you by Dr. Shaw and and even that first case, and to show you how we're using it clinically, and hopefully how it can benefit um, your practice as well. So I've got four cases, and each has a specific um, point to it. So we'll start with the first patient. He's a 47-year-old male. He's got atypical chest pain, some risk factors, but really was referred to us. Uh, he's a high-powered executive and was sent to us as part of an executive physical package uh, from a community provider. And so um, each of us have our own way of uh, reading coronary CTAs. Uh, this is my uh, default for how I start. I first look at the uh, calcium score. Unfortunately, the video is not playing here. Um, and then after that, I will look at the axial images and then um, go on to the post-processing software. Now, in this particular case, if the video was playing, it would show you that his calcium score uh, was zero. Uh, which is great. So I'm already feeling good. And then, uh, but nonetheless, it's still important to review 
the MPRs, you don't want to miss um, an occult uh, significant stenosis from non-calcified plaque. So that's the way that I was reading coronary CTAs prior to the implementation of roadmap. Now, uh, this is how I do things with roadmap. So now um, what I do first is I look actually at the roadmap. So it's sent directly to our packs. And I know that it becomes available um, when the status in our packs changes. So then I can open up the study. I look at the roadmap first, then I review the corner of CTA. Uh, and then actually, I don't even, uh, in, in a case like this, um, where the calcium score is zero and the roadmap is normal, um, and here, oh, video is not working. So no Zoom presentation would be complete without some technical challenges. But nonetheless, here you can see that there's no capsules identified on the roadmap. Um, there's no stenosis detected at all. So we know that basically there's, there's no plaque seen by roadmap. Calcium score is zero. My next step then would be to just review the NPRs. I don't even uh, bother pulling up our post-processing software. I don't, wait, I don't spend time uh, having to load it and, and enter the patient information. I look here just to verify. Um, that there's uh, no uh, disease present, again, because we're still the primary readers. Roadmap is, is a tool to assist us, an adjunctive tool, but again, we maintain primary responsibility. Um, and then I sign off the report. So in, in 90 seconds or two minutes, uh, I'm done with this coronary CTA and can move on to the next study. So, you know, really, I, um, the point of this case is to emphasize that to realize, to really realize the maximal efficiency gain with roadmap, it's important from my perspective to review it both prior to and basically concurrently with the CTA. Now here, as a normal study, you basically just know that ahead of time, it's normal, calcium score zero, quick review of the NPR is normal, and you're done. Um, second case is a 78-year-old male who's got a history of a, a prior aortic valve replacement, it has got some cardiac risk factors, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes. He's a former smoker. Uh, he does have a history of, an, of a non-STEMI. And he was referred to us because he was complaining of uh, intermittent uh, sharp uh, chest pains. And so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, with the implementation of roadmap, this is what I would do first. I'd start by reviewing the roadmap scan. Um, and just very quickly, in just one simple glance, I've essentially... Um, ruled out obstructive coronary disease. So there is some disease present here based on the roadmap, especially in the circumflex, but I know based on the yellow capsule that it's all non-obstructive. Um, and additionally, now I know I can target my attention to this area when I go to review it. Now, versus what I would do without roadmap is I'd start with the calcium score. And as you can see, there's, there's, there's three vessel coronary disease. And now I'm going to be uh, worried and thinking, preparing myself, this is going to be a more time-consuming uh, case. You know, I'm looking here at the RCA where there's this big chunky uh, plaque um, and uh, uh, looking in, in other areas as well, knowing that, okay, this is not going to be a normal case and I need to gird myself that I'm going to need to spend more time. That's the old way of doing it. But now I have the advantage with roadmap that I know there's non-obstructive disease, um, so I don't have to uh, perseverate as much over looking for areas of stenosis. And again, as Dr. Shaw pointed out, you can either choose to look at it here on the, on the spider view, which is specific to this patient's anatomy, or certainly on the uh, MPRs, which are overlaid with the capsules denoting the areas of stenosis. So after I've uh, reviewed the roadmap and the, and the calcium score, then I'll just go on to the MPRs, um, confirming in, the, uh, in this case that there is no obstructive disease. Again, the advantage here is that I don't need to spend the time opening up my post-processing software, running down the course of the vessels to verify um, the presence and significance of stenoses uh, in the vessels. And in fact, boom, that's what you have here. Here's my dictation done with the report. Uh, no need again to open, open the post-processing software uh, or spend time in in-depth review. And I've maximized, really maximized my efficiency. So the point of this case is to demonstrate the efficiency gain that you uh, receive by using roadmap with non-obstructive disease. And essentially, what you're doing is you're leveraging the high sensitivity and the high negative predictive value of coronary CTA. And so since I know with a high degree of confidence that there's no obstructive disease, so there's no obstructive coronary disease by the roadmap, I can just focus my time on identifying any areas of minimal stenosis. Like here in the LAD, we know that there's some plaque in the LAD, but it's all less than 30% because it's not highlighted by roadmap. So I'm just just checking to look for other areas of non-obstructive disease, sign up the report, and move to the next case. My uh, third uh, 
case presentation is about a 70-year-old male who uh, was uh, having symptoms of dyspnea on exertion, has some risk factors of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. He did have an abnormal uh, stress test that showed an ischemia in his apical inferior wall. His uh, referring cardiologist wanted to send him for a calf, but the patient declined uh, and so was referred instead for non-invasive imaging with a coronary CTA. And uh, this patient is um, uh, somewhat of a complementary or companion case to Dr. Shaw's case, although certainly different demographics. But in this case, um, again, I start out by looking at the roadmap. And just very quickly, I can tell that there's severe stenosis in the proximal left circumflex here, the proximal RCA uh, here, uh, and then a moderate stenosis um, in the uh, mid LAD. And that's denoted by the red capsule for a moderate stenosis and the severe stenoses are denoted by the purple capsules. Now, not surprisingly, uh, this patient with triple vessel disease, uh, as the calcium score zooms through here, you can see he's got a significantly elevated calcium score. It was in around the 1800 range. But here, if we're just looking at the calcium score first, without the benefit of roadmap, we're thinking, oh, geez, there's a lot of disease here. I'm going to have to really get prepared for battle. Uh, but the fortunate thing about the roadmap is, yeah, we know there's we know there's significant disease here, at least denoted by roadmap, but we can focus our attention to the areas of interest and not spend time in the areas where there's no significant disease identified. So again, after I've reviewed the roadmap and reviewed the calcium score, my next step with my new workflow integrating roadmap is to just look at the MPRs. I review the MPRs first to confirm um, the presence of st uh, significant stenoses in the target vessels identified by roadmap. Um, and if there is, if the if those findings are concordant, then I don't need to pull up my post-processing software. Alternatively, sometimes I will pull up my post-processing software if it's not clear. As you saw in the case by Dr. Shaw, no study is perfect. And sometimes you will get an overestimation of disease, but still the benefit is there in the sense that I'm just focusing my attention on those areas of stenosis identified a significant disease identified by roadmap and don't need to spend as much effort and time focusing on areas where there's no significant disease identified by the roadmap software. So in this particular patient, due to the presence of uh, multivessel uh, stenosis, significant disease, as I mentioned previously, we sent the patient for FFRCT analysis and I've highlighted the, the different vessels in different colors here. So the circumflex, the, the severe stenosis and the and the proximal left circumflex was non-hemodynamically significant at 0.84. The stenosis, the moderate stenosis in the mid LAD here in orange was non-hemodynamically significant at 0.87. And the um, severe stenosis in the proximal RCA was at borderline hemodynamically significant at 0.78. The patient was then referred for angiography. There's no, as you can see here on the, on the left heart path here in the LAD, there's no significant disease. There is a significant stenosis here in the proximal left circumflex, but that was not hemodynamically significant by IFR. And then lastly, there is this severe stenosis in the RCA, which corresponds to the area identified on the coronary CTA and the FFR CT. And that was hemodynamically significant by IFR, and that was stented. So um, this is the opposite spectrum from the case I showed previously. Previously, I showed you a case of non-obstructive disease and discussing the value of roadmap for non-obstructive disease. Here we have a case of multivessel coronary disease, significant disease, whether it's multivessel uh, significant disease or single vessel significant disease. Um, you know, it's important to note that uh, roadmap is an anatomic tool. And so it's gonna suffer the same hit to specificity as we've known for years with coronary CTA. Um, it's an anatomic test. So anatomy is not physiology as we know from the FFR CT literature quite eloquently. But in these cases, and so, you know, it is possible for FFRCT, excuse me, for, um, for the roadmap to overestimate the severity of stenosis, just like uh, we do when we humans read coronary CTAs. But in these cases, I find that roadmap is beneficial for two reasons. Number one, as I mentioned previously, it allows me to quickly target those areas of stenosis or possible significant stenosis, um, even like in this case, in a background of diffuse coronary disease. And then the other thing that is um, perhaps not as quantifiable, but in my practice, and I think probably in our lives just as important, is that it, it reduces that sense of, of friction when we're interpreting cases. So if you're bulk reading cases like Dr. Shaw is, or maybe you don't have the same volume, um, but you know it's, it's late in the day, you know this case comes along and you know, okay, 
I got to get myself emotionally prepared to, to go to battle here with this case. Uh, but now with roadmap, you know, it's really targeted just those areas of interest. And I can focus my attention on that and keep my efficiency going, reduce that sense of fatigue, reader fatigue and friction as I'm going through my cases. And then the last case I'm going to show you very briefly is a 50-year-old male with exertional dyspnea. He's got a history of uh, pulmonary hypertension and, and drug use and was referred to us for a coronary CTA. Um, and there was no obstructive disease that was present in this patient, fortunately. But the point of me showing this case is actually just to highlight and building upon what Dr. Shaw said before, is that there are instances in which roadmap will overestimate severity of stenosis. Um, and and in, in our practice, typically we see those, or I think the areas where you, you should may more likely see that is where there's low contrast to noise ratio. So like in this particular uh, small vessel here where we've just got some image noise and there it can fool the AI algorithm. So small vessel size, poor opacification, and then certainly areas of artifact. Same things that can trip up FFR CT analysis as well. So to summarize, I've gone through several cases trying to highlight three important points. Number one is when you're reviewing roadmap, in my experience, it's important to do it prior to and concurrently with the CTA. And so in our practice, in order to do that, roadmap is sent directly to our PACs to maximize our efficiency. Um, roadmap does improve my efficiency with an interpreting coronary CTA, both for patients with non-obstructive disease as well as obstructive disease. And then lastly, I find it beneficial in, in reducing that sense of, of fatigue or friction as I'm reviewing cases. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, Dr. Morris, thank you so much. Those are wonderful cases and uh, certainly cover a breadth of disease and patient presentations. So it's just great, thank you. If you want to stop sharing so we can see yep. one another. Yep. Um, so there go. are okay. a couple of questions, Dr. Morris, that came in. I, I think one, one that's interesting is the following. Um, reading, this is interesting based on one of your one of your cases reading a quote negative study with negative roadmap may miss non-calcified plaque which is less than 30 percent which in a 40 year old may be you know a, ma a major missed opportunity to initiate preventive therapy so th thoughts on that yeah it, it's an excellent question and, and actually uh, both dr shaw and i have uh very nice examples of patients who basically had calcium score of zero and just a single stenosis you know, either obstructive or non-obstructive um, and important to treat for that reason. Um, you know, for that very point, it's important two things. So number one is when you review the roadmap, um, even though it only highlights those stenoses that are more than 30%, there's another little box there that says stenosis detected or not. And so if it doesn't detect any stenosis, even um, stenosis less than 30%, you know, that will be denoted there in that little box as was shown previously. And I'm happy to show that slide. But the other thing I think that's important is that even in this case of where we had no disease, you know, I looked at the roadmap and the calcium score, I still reviewed the NPRs for that very reason. We want to make sure we're not missing even subtle areas of non-obstructive disease. You know, the efficiency gain here, though, is I don't need to spend the time running through the entire course of the vessel with the high granularity, but instead look at just the NPRs. And then the, the next question I have is not one from the queue, but it's one I wanted to uh, get both of your thoughts on. And it's, it relates to, uh, Dr. Shaw, something you mentioned, which is in a practice with, which is growing the number of readers and certainly training fellows in many cases, including at your institution, the ways in which this may be helpful in that dynamic. And then the second is, as you think about people reading more and more and more and more, right, as CT continues to grow at the clip at which it's growing, how you see this tool as potentially an ally for readers of whatever experience, just in terms of managing workload. So maybe Dr. Shah, let me start with you and get your thoughts, especially on the training and number of readers. And then maybe Dr. Morris turn to you for that second question. So Dr. Shah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I definitely, you know, again, we, we're, we're a group of 11 readers and we've all been, you know, you know, and again, radiologists, cardiologists, so we all, we all have different approaches. Um, even the ones who I've trained, you know, still again, they they develop their own method, and so there's always very there's there's definitely variability. Uh, not saying one is better than the other, but again, to have a tool that can help assist to you know establish consistency, I think that's there's a lot of value in that. Um, to kind of you know to have a a fallback too, you know, to, again to to look at it ahead of time too, 
um, uh, in concurrence, but also, you know, it, it's, it's, but it becomes a way to, to, you know, that, you know, in case, again, nobody's perfect, you know, we're all human, right? And so uh, to have a, a tool that can, you know, that you can use to say, oh, there is something there that, and, you know, and I, I didn't see it on my initial review of, of the images. Um, so I think, I think that is, it, and, I, and I think, and as all, you know, as we all deal with the, the, with the increased volumes that will be coming our way with the chest pain guidelines and all that, we need more readers. There's a huge supply demand mismatch. Um, so we need a lot more readers. And so, and these readers are, uh, they're all going to be, you know, newly trained, whether they're existing cardiologists or coming out of fellowship or existing radiologists. So, so it, it, this is, it, we, we do need tools like these to help uh, when it comes to, you know, maintaining consistency throughout so that referral, referring physician doesn't have to worry about who's reading the study. That's one, thank you. That's extremely helpful. And Dr. Morris, we'd love your thoughts on that as well, especially the notion of sort of reading through studies and fatigue that may set in, et cetera. How, how does it strike you in that regard? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I've, I've really found it, and my colleagues who also read our practice with it, I found it very valuable for that reason. You know, I, I think of it sort of in a paradigm of, you know, as we look to establish the efficiency gain that you achieve with corner with with roadmap reading corner CT, you know, it's almost like, you know, you can you, you read X number of studies, four, five, six, whatever it is, two, three, four, and you get the, the next one for free, right, because of that efficiency gain. So you, you, you can read more studies in the same amount of time that you otherwise would have had before. And that that is is very valuable both from a in a workflow perspective. But then secondly, it's that friction component, it's that fatigue component, because you know it allows us to just maintain our, our peak performance. And you know, hopefully I'm not missing more cases as the day goes on, but but you know, certainly the 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 way that I'm approaching the day um, and approaching the cases helps with that roadmap because it, it just kind of greases the wheels um, and allows me to to go through the list faster, more efficiently, and 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 more accurately. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there are two. There are two quick questions that I'll I'll take that are just directed about to heart flow. One is where outside is Roadmap and FFR available? Question Latin America. The answer is that Roadmap is available only in the U.S. at present. There are certainly plans underway to have it introduced elsewhere. Uh, FFRCT is available more broadly, not in Latin America, not in Latin America at present. And then the second was, is there a possibility that the roadmap interface is directly available to the CT processing workstation without the need for sending to heart flow? The answer to that is no, that's not the way that both for FFR CT and for roadmap, the process has been constructed. And the reason for that is really one of quality as, as I think people may be familiar, uh, although the artificial intelligence piece is, is a critical part of this, there also is a human in the loop for all of these cases for quality inspection and correction. Uh, and that we believe at HeartFlow is a critical ingredient for both reproducibility and accuracy and quality. So let me just close off on those. Um, and then maybe the last, I'm sensitive to time and appreciate everyone's time. The last, and I would love both of your thoughts on this is the following. Uh, in real practice, some of the CTAs are not gonna be as perfect as those you presented. Uh, in such cases, do you see that there might be artifacts created which would let, let readers spend more time to differentiate those? I assume that means with uh, roadmap. Would roadmap add time, or do you see roadmap saving more time in practice? Thank you from the questioner. So maybe let's reverse the order. Dr. Morris would love your thoughts on that, just in terms of time, both for high quality scans and for scans that may have artifact. And then Dr. Shaw would love your thoughts as well, just as the last part of this discussion. Yeah, it's, it's a very insightful question. Thank you very much for asking. Um, you know, uh, number one is we know from multiple studies now that really high quality image acquisition is really paramount to ensuring uh, accuracy, both, uh, well, first with FFRCT analysis, but since this utilizes a very similar pathway, uh, for the roadmap analysis. And certainly there are cases in which the image quality is so poor that it just, it doesn't pass that initial uh, uh, quality test. So it, it, is a, it is a good point. And I think that what this teaches us is the importance of optimizing image quality on the front end 
to minimize the amount of work that uh, unnecessary work, perhaps that we're spending on the back end cleaning up images. So really trying to focus on making our life simple, I think is is really paramount to realizing the maximal benefits of the roadmap. Great, thank you. And Dr. Shaw. Yeah, I mean, so if I have a study, and even my the example I showed you certainly was a perfect. The RCA was was great out. Um, but if I have a study where there's artifact, but still good enough for roadmap analysis and for FFRCT, I would it help? Would the roadmap help me uh, resolve the artifact sooner? I'm not sure about that because I think I think whenever as a good rule, whenever you're dealing with artifacts, um, again, the roadmap may it'll it, it may draw my, it likely will draw my attention to that artifact because it may be detecting something there, and then it, then it's up to you as a reader to determine is this real or is this artifact? So I think, again, it, it likely will draw your attention to it. Would, would it help you resolve the artifact quicker? I think that's hard to say. I think anytime you're dealing with artifacts, that it's always gonna involve a little more thought than, uh, than a nice, you know, perfect study. Great, well, thank you. And with that, again, sensitive to people's time, I think we'll close the webinar. Uh, very grateful, Dr. Shah, Dr. Morris, for your taking the time and grateful uh, to SCCT for their partnership in what hopefully has been a worthwhile and educational use of time. Thank you everybody for joining.